Our next keynote speaker is a man that really doesn't need much introduction. Uh, I don't know if you guys knew this or not, but he is uh, Tony Starnes, former driver, a former 9th District Congressman, local business leader, proud family man. My pleasure to introduce Mike Sodrell. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to be around such uh, patriotic Americans. The great weather. Before I really start, I'd like to share with you, our, our president said he didn't think America was an exceptional place. And the first lady said uh, she was proud to be an American for the first time in her life during the presidential campaign. And I want to give you three reasons why I think America is an exceptional place. Really a unique place. Number one, our revolution was fought, started by people that had something to lose. If you read the bottom of the Declaration of Independence, right above the signatures, it says, we pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Revolutions are not normally started by people that have something to lose. They're usually started by people that have nothing to lose. Alexander Hamilton, one of the signatures you find there, <laughs> was arguably the richest man in America in 1776. He was the Bill Gates of his day. Thomas Jefferson had two 5,000 acre plantations. His home still stands at Monticello, Monticello there in Charlottesville, Virginia. George Washington's home still stands on the banks of the Potomac. The second thing that made America really unique, an exceptional place, is our revolution was fought to achieve liberty. Revolutions are not normally fought to achieve liberty. Mao Zedong didn't prosecute a revolution in China to bring liberty to the Chinese people. Fidel Castro didn't carry on a revolution in Cuba to bring liberty to the Cuban people, nor did Stalin or Lenin or most of the other revolutionaries in the world. Our revolution was unique because it was fought to achieve liberty. The third thing that made our revolution probably unique King George said of George Washington at the conclusion of the Revolutionary War after Yorktown when the British had conceded, King George said of George Washington, if he voluntarily gives up power, he's the greatest man in the world. King George understood how intoxicating power was. He had a lot of it. Washington's soldiers said they would make him king. He said, if you speak of it again, I'll have you court-martialed and hung. He went to the Continental Congress, presented his sword, and said like Cincinnatus, the famous Roman general, he was going home to sit under his fig and van. He not only gave up power voluntarily once, he gave it up twice. After the Constitutional Convention, which he didn't want to attend, he wound up being our first president. After his first term, he was elected for a second term. After his second term, they said, you need to run again. He said, no. No president should serve more than two terms as president of the United States. And for the second time, he voluntarily gave up power and went home. Part of what's wrong in Washington, D.C. today is we have people serving in the Congress that will not voluntarily give up power. When our 32nd president, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, refused to leave office after two terms, we passed a constitutional amendment. Those of you that have a constitution in your pocket, look it up, it was 1951. It would prohibit any president from serving more than two terms. So since they wouldn't do it by gentleman's agreement, we had to do it by law, and that's what we're gonna to have to do with the Congress. But I'd like to share with you uh, some of the words of Thomas Paine. Very eloquent people, our founders. This one's called Sunshine Patriot. It was part of the crisis papers. You know, it's, uh, it's been said that Washington's sword wouldn't have been effective without Payne's pen. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. 
Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap, the more that the, the we esteem too lightly. It is dearness that gives everything its value. Heaven knows how to put a proper price on its goods, and it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. Britain, with an army to enforce her tyranny, has declared that she has the right not only to tax, but to, quote, bind us in all cases whatsoever. And if being bound in that manner is not slavery, then there is not such a thing as slavery on the earth. Even the expression is impious, for so unlimited a power can belong only to God. Those words came from the pen of Thomas Paine. As I said earlier, it's been said that the sword of Washington would have been for naught without Paine's pen. One could substitute the word Washington, D.C. for Britain, and this would be close to being appropriate today. The Obama administration and its minions on Capitol Hill has declared their right to tax and to spend and to, quote, bind us in all cases whatsoever, unquote. The socialist dripping on the rock of liberty has become a flash flood of taxation, regulation, and strangulation of the economic well-being of our people. We will not stand idly by while our liberty and the economic opportunities for our children and theirs are washed away in a tar torrent of legislation, regulation, and taxation. Will you? Thomas Jefferson penned a paragraph in our Declaration of Independence that's appropriate today. Quote, he has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. This government takeover of our health care system fits Jefferson's description to a T. President Obama and Obama clones in our Congress are erecting a multitude of new offices to enforce this government takeover of our health care system. They are hiring an additional 16,500 IRS agents as part of the swarms of officers, along with other new bureaucrats that will be sent hither to harass our people. They will eat out our substance with new taxes, fines, and additional paperwork. We cannot stand silent while this government grows and our economy shrinks. We must repeal this 2,600-page monstrosity and replace it with common sense health care reform. We can reform health care without growing the size of government. We need to reduce these swarms of officers, not grow them. The American people are taxed enough. They don't need additional taxes that eat out their substance. We will not and we will not forfeit our Fourth Amendment rights to be secure in our persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. We We will not stand idly by while some bureaucrat decides which of us will live and which of us will die. We will not forfeit our health care decisions to the government. Speaking of eating out our substance, that brings us to cap and trade. We are told we must have this legislation to prevent global climate change or global warming, as the previous speaker said, whatever they're calling it this week. But the key word here is global. This is, we are told, a global problem. The problem is 1.3 billion Chinese are not going to participate in imposing these new taxes and regulations on their economy. Over 1 billion Indians are not going to subject their economy to this tax and regulatory burden. Billions more in Africa, South America, and elsewhere around the globe will not have this drain on their economies. You don't have to be a PhD to apply a little Hoosier common sense. 
there are multiple billions of people on this planet that will not bear the economic burden of taxes and, and regulations. President Obama and his clones in the U.S. House want 300 million Americans to commit economic suicide. Do the math, folks. This is not science in this case. It's simple mathematics. When literally billions of people on this globe are able to raise crops, manufacture goods, and conduct commerce without these additional swarms of officers to harass their people and eat out their substance, America loses. We will work hard to be efficient in our use of our natural resources. We will work hard to be good stewards of the land. We will work hard to rest as lightly on the planet as we can. But we will not stand idly by while you drive the rest of our manufacturing out of the United States. We will not stand idly by while you drive down our standard of living. And we will not stand idly by while you steal our children's future. People used to sacrifice for their children. You often hear of the financial sacrifices made by parents so their children could have an opportunity for a better life. Each generation worked hard for themselves and their posterity. Each generation, in effect, stood on the shoulders of the previous generation. Americans used to sacrifice for their children. Now President Obama and his minions are stealing from them. When you borrow money to buy a home, the bank expects you to make the mortgage payments, or at least they used to. When you borrow money to buy a car, you're expected to pay it back before cash for loans anyway. President Obama and his partners in crime on Capitol Hill are stealing billions, no, trillions, from our children and grandchildren. They are spending borrowed money that future generations of Americans will have to repay. Just the interest payments alone can eat out their substance. This irresponsible spending is not stimulating our economy. The taxes that they will impose to pay for this level of spending will smother our economy. We will not stand idly by while you commit our children to buy houses they never lived in to pay for cars they never rode in, and to pay credit card bill for this administration and this Congress. 